I hope so far you guys have enjoyed this retro wrestling review series and remember to make your suggestions in the comments of this video. I'll pick from a few of the most popular options or choices left and people can vote on them on Twitter and Facebook. You can find all the Twitter, Facebook profile information in the description box down below. And this could be old Raws, Smackdowns, Nitros, Impact episodes. This could be pay-per-views. This could be wrestling-related movies. This can be DVD sets, whatever. Put your suggestions in the comments section below and make them good. And some of the best choices, the most popular choices, will get voted on on social media. And speaking of DVD sets, remember the challenge has been made. If you guys as a unit buy 15 of these Assume Jeff Jarrett position shirts from the OTR Essential Store at Pro Wrestling Tees. By the end of September, I will have no choice to hold up my end of the bargain and buy the four fucking disc Jeff Jarrett set that TNA put out years ago. Watch all 16 hours of those four discs combined and then come on here and review all four discs for you. If you are the six sadistic fucks that I believe you to be, then do your part. Go to the OTR Essential Store at Pro Wrestling Tees and hashtag buy the shirt. Buy the Assume Jeff Jarrett position shirt. I don't care if one of you buys 15 of them if you're so inclined. Get to 15 of them, then I have to buy that stupid DVD set and I'm going to have to watch it all and review it. Ugh. Anyways. Time to put your money where your mouth is. You want to torture me? Here's your chance. Anyways, on to the topic at hand, which is WWF Backlash 2000. Or as I refer to this show, what WrestleMania 2000 should have been, especially the main event. If you remember WrestleMania 16, I believe it was at the pond in Anaheim. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I believe that's where it was. It was not a very good show. It was just very, very lackluster. And in the main event, you know, yes, you had Big Show, you had Foley. He finally was going to main event a WrestleMania. There's Rock and there's Triple H. And that main event was just ultimately a McMahon in every corner, which ultimately meant it was McMahon versus McMahon versus McMahon versus McMahon. It was ultimately all about the McMahons. And instead of WrestleMania where typically Vince tries to give the people the go-home happy type of feeling... The, the whole presentation of it, the finish was lame, and I felt disappointed everyone. But Backlash shouldn't have, and Backlash most certainly didn't, and I know going back and watching it 17 plus years later, it was just striking some of the things that just leapt out at me as I'm watching it on the WWE Network. Just absolutely leapt out at me. Some of the matches, the guys didn't have to do very much at all, and they got an incredible reaction. Some of the things, the guy had one thing, you know, Scotty Too Hotty, he had the worm, he had one real thing, but man, he owned it, and the people just exploded for it, and, and it, it helps you to understand is, I guess it doesn't really matter how you connect with the fans, ultimately it's about if you can connect with the fans and how deeply you can connect with them. And so many of these guys from back in this time frame were able to connect because of the personalities, because of the characters, and he didn't have to do all the extreme shit. Now, granted, there was extreme shit during this time frame in WWF. There's no question about it. But it meant so much more because of the power of personality and the strength and quality and depth of so many of the characters. And frankly, the storytelling at the time. Just really striking. And, you know, the MCI Center, and that's leapt out to me because 2000, when this pay-per-view happened, within a few months, I actually ended up working for MCI soon after and made it two years uh, to hear that name, man, that was a blast from the past. Woo! I'm telling you, now it's the Verizon Center, but the MCI Center, oh my goodness. Um, just so many things about this. You see the WWF.com advertisement and just looking back at the old graphics and you know, hearing Jerry the King Lawler and JR on commentary in the roles that they should be and just how crisp so much of the commentary was and how great the commentary was and how hot the crowds were, how many more times the amount of signs you saw um, compared to now, how many more times you saw the fans react during matches and especially at the beginning or at the end of matches like stand up and pop and give you the old uh, smell fee, if you will, 
the old raise your hands if you're sure type of thing that you just don't get consistently today, especially all throughout the show. It's a really, really fun show and so infinitely better than WrestleMania 2000. Like literally, if you had taken this card and switched it with WrestleMania 2000, WrestleMania 16, I think everybody probably would have been happier. Uh, but let's talk about the card and run it down. Edge and Christian, the tag champion, successfully defended against DX, which in this case was the Road Dog and X Pac. And it's funny to hear some of the inklings of the X Pac heat. X Pac sucks, X Pac sucks. Uh, a solid opener. It's just crazy on a card that I believe had, what, one, two, three tag team matches that the tag champs were kicking off this show. It's kind of strange, but it kind of works because ultimately this show was really all about one match. So let's be perfectly honest. Everything was filler. Everything was set up, no matter how good some of the other stuff was. And that's fine. Just enough to amuse the people for two hours and 15, two hours and 20 minutes until you got to the one match that everybody came to see. Uh, Dean Malenko defeated Scotty Too Hottie in their light heavyweight championship match. And it was... Great to see Scotty Tuhati do the worm. You forget just how cool some of the shit from back in this time was. Uh, Dean Malenko, I'm sorry. Unpopular wrestling take. I always thought he was boring as bricks. Sure, he was good in terms of execution. And sure, he was good in terms of the actual moveset that he could do. But there just never was a whole lot there to me. And again, you could flame away at me in the comments section. I just... Never was a fan of Dean Malenko. With that said, I actually thought it really worked here, the type of personality, the type of character that he was, as a complete contrast, contradictory to what Scotty Too Hotty was. So the dynamics of the two characters, I felt, really made this match, and it was actually pretty good. One of the best matches of the night beyond question. A boss man and Bull Buchanan defeated the APA, and man, John Cena... If you want to do that fucking famous or off the top rope, watch Bull Buchanan do it and you'll see how it's actually supposed to be done. But just think about this, the depth of the tag team match division at this time. And granted, this match was not great. I mean, it was barely passable. But you had Bossman and Bull Buchanan and they were just another tag team. You had the APA who hadn't even really become the APA APA at that time quite yet to me. Uh, you had... The Hardys were in the freaking hardcore title match, which I'll talk about in a moment. You had Edge and Christian, you had the Dudley Boys, you had TNA, just all these great tag teams just spoke to the overall depth of talent of the roster at that time. Just incredible stuff. The hardcore championship. Did I like this one better than the one at WrestleMania? I don't know. It almost felt like, while I appreciated the gimmick and the concept of trying to have to beat Crash Holly and everybody's ha gonna have to go after Crash Holly and that's the only way you're gonna win is to beat Crash Holly and how the odds are so stacked against them the match I think struggled it had a couple of highlights but in general it felt like it was too long now granted they were trying to tell a story throughout the match and they did tell a really good story throughout the match everybody's trying to get to Crash Holly everybody's trying to Hit Crash Holly. Everybody's trying to beat Crash Holly, pin Crash Holly, because that's the only way they're going to win the God Bless and Hardcore Championship. Just incredible stuff. And it was kind of sad to watch this match, too, because so many things about Crash Holly were just awesome. Just absolutely awesome. When you talk about guys that were never main eventers, but man, they got it. You talk about guys that were given something that had no business working. And they got it over like a billion bucks. To me, that's Crash Holly. Talking about the super heavyweight carrying the scale down the ring, even though he didn't for this match, weighing in well in excess of 400 pounds, not to mention the 24-7 rules of the hardcore title, which to this day, many of us still look back upon so fondly. In fact, the only thing that was disappointing about the 24-7 rules of this hardcore championship and this hardcore championship match in particular is that after Crash overcomes all these obstacles and ultimately pins Taz and retains his title as he's going up the ramp, somebody should have come up, clothesline him, or hit their finisher on him, and bam, one, two, three, and off you go. Um, Man, it's just sad to think that within three years, Crash Hollywood was dead. But he was a phenomenal talent. And I think when we talk about people 
that that deserve more love when it comes to WWE Hall of Fame. I know he didn't have a incredibly long run, but when you think about the hardcore championship, you think about Crash Holly. Crash Holly made that belt, and he was not a super hardcore guy, you know, by any means. But the power of personality, the power of his character, the the wrestling knowledge that he had, just the, that it factor for what he was and who he was and how much he got it. I mean, when you think about the hardcore championship, you think about 24-7 rules, and who do you think of as the champion? What do you have, 22 title reigns? <laughs> I think about the hardcore championship, and I laugh still to this day. And it brings a smile to my face. And seeing Crash Holly here again brought a big-ass smile to my face. It's something that I wish they would institute now with one of the titles that don't mean any damn thing is some 24-7 rules. Because it would be a way to inject some spontaneity into the product and give you some random, off-the-wall, crazy, fun crap. Man, the 24-7 defense rules for the hardcore title brought us so many good memories. The freaking, what was it, the kids park at the mall where they're trying to go down the slide? I mean, just on and on and on. <laughs> Pinning somebody. I mean, all this shit. Just fucking epic. Just absolutely epic. And Crash Holly was epic. Rest in peace, indeed. Uh, then we got to something that was not so epic. We were at this time in WWO where they weren't quite sure apparently what to do with the big show. With tears that are soaked, I'm sad to hear that your daddy finally croaked. We moved on to that from that to in 2000, all of a sudden after Mania, we've got Big Show doing all of these impersonations. And here he is. He's the showster. And it's funny that as Hulkster's old music first hits, the MCI Center really doesn't know what to do with themselves. They know this can't be Hogan. So there's like no reaction. And then they see Big Show dressed up as the showster. And there is kind of a reaction. And God damn, this was funny. Angle's promo beforehand was funny. And I appreciated just how good he was at being able to kind of toe the line. Talking about, you know, when you talk about honesty and lying, look at the president. But then he wouldn't do anything more. He would just touch on it and move on. It was like stick jab, stick jab, you know. Dodge and weave, stick jab. Man, Kurt Angle as that parody hero heel was awesome. And Big Show, I, I'll say this about Big Show. They put him in a lot of bad situations. They've done a lot of dumb shit with him over the years. And he's done his best every time to always try and get it over. And shit, you know, in the context of this show, this is fucking funny. The match wasn't much. But it didn't need to be much. Not every match needs to be something. This match was what it was, and we moved the hell on. Uh, TNA defeated the Dudley Boys, but of course the whole premise here of this match was about Bubba's infatuation and obsession with Trish Stratus. And who could blame the man? I don't give a fuck if it's a work or a shoot. It doesn't matter. I would have assessed over those tits and that ass and that box back in 2000. You fucking kidding me? I'd have bumped Lillian Garcia out of the fucking way to be the first one to be face down in that muff. Jesus Christ, you forget just how sexy that fucking woman was. Not, not so much now, but back then? I mean, you look at Trish, and then you look at the women of today in WWE, and you say, woof, woof, what the fuck? And then you look at Trish, and you're like, oh my effing God. I mean, like, if you were Bubba Ray at that time, and as you put her up on your shoulders, would you even want to drop her on the table? I, I don't know. But it fit into the whole shtick of Bubba putting women through tables. And this is a carryover from ECW crap. And this was fine for what it was. It really was. Um, I don't think the match was especially outstanding. But again, there was a storytelling element there of Bubba's going to be so obsessed with Trish that it's going to cost him. And ultimately, it did cost him the match. But yet at the same point in time, Bubba still ultimately got his, put Trish through the table. And then there's... Test and Albert afterwards all panicking and worried about their side piece and what happened to her going through that table and everybody's fucking happy. That's the WWF of 2000. We're cheering the hottest chick in the biz getting put through a damn table and it's awesome. Speaking of awesome, Latino heat. <laughs> Eddie Guerrero in China. Oh my goodness. This brought back so many memories and it's just sad as you're watching this match with him and S.A. Rios for the European Championship, I believe it was. Yes, it was. Um, 
to think that both Eddie Guerrero and China are gone. And Eddie's been gone 12 years now. And China's been gone, what, a little over a year now? Just depressing and sad. But at least I'll say this. You put that feeling of depression or sadness, I should say, aside. And you enjoy these two for who they were. And fuck those that want to shit on China. Fuck those that want to talk about China wasn't very good. I'll tell you this much. China, regardless of what anybody wants to say, found a way to get more massively over the 98% of the roster even at this time. Let alone in the course of the company's history of all time. If you don't think China deserves to be in the WWE Hall of Fame, if you don't think China is one of the best and most influential and important women in the history of that company, and frankly in the history of the wrestling business, would you please turn around, bend over, and stick your head up your fucking ass if there's any more room? Because otherwise you're full of shit. Give me a break. Match is okay. I was just caught up in the nostalgia of seeing Eddie Guerrero and China together, man. <laughs> Dress it up like they're going to prom. And here they come out in the 57, I believe it was. Just good times, man. The IC title match. Chris Jericho versus the guy that walked into this match, the championship, successfully defended due to disqualification, but we don't name him. The match was good. I don't believe it to be great. Uh, he was probably in the right place on the card. The only thing I will say is I thought the finish was kind of lame. The whole thing as the guy who doesn't exist that's invisible comes down and gets ready to headbutt Chris Jericho. Jericho holds up the title and that's the way it ended. It was just kind of, ah. Like you're getting into the match and then that happens. And to me, that was disappointing. But ultimately, again, as I talk about this show, and while there's moments of nostalgia pops for me, and there are some decent things on here, this was ultimately all about one match. It was all about The Rock versus Triple H for the WWF Championship. The main event we should have gotten at WrestleMania 2000. The main event that we got here. And I love even the story that played out post-mania heading into this backlash. You remember Triple H's bad day? What was that? April, was that April 17th, 2000? Where at the beginning of the night, Jericho beats Triple H for the title, and then Earl Hebner has to reverse this decision only for him to get fired. Then here comes uh, Linda McMahon, and she's announcing sends of Vince and, and everybody, and Stephanie's going to be in Triple H's corner at backlash. That Stone Cold Steve Austin is going to be in the Rock's corner. Remember, this is at the time that Stone Cold was out due to the neck surgery. And, and just to hear on that episode of Raw, the crowd pop for the announcement that Austin was going to be at the pay-per-view. Not that he was there. Not that his music actually hit and he was coming out. Just for the sheer announcement that he's going to be there at Backlash. Man, when you talk about being massively over... That is the ultimate definition and measurement of massively over. They pop at the mere mention of your name and not just a kitty pop. I'm talking about a full booming bass fucking manly pop. Just incredible. And even then, when you talk about the attention to detail, and I know Vince hasn't always been the best of details guy, but at that time, they would do things sometimes that was just like, this is incredible. So when later on in that episode of Raw... Out comes, was it Stephanie, and out comes Shane, and out comes Hunter, and they're going to confront Linda McMahon after she's made the announcement. And ultimately, Stephanie gets smacked, if I recall correctly, by Linda McMahon. And then Hunter goes after, because his girl has been hit, struck by his mother, so he goes after Linda. And Shane, who's clearly aligned with Hunter, who's clearly aligned with Stephanie, even that crossed the line. Even though he just smacked, his mom just smacked his sister, that's still his mom, and you don't fucking do that. And then you've got Stephanie smacking both of them. It was those small details that occasionally the company would just nail out of the fucking park. And I always loved that small, small detail. Was that Linda smacks Stephanie, but once Hunter goes after Linda, Shane's pissed, and he wants to beat the hell out of Triple H. I'm like, that is common sense storytelling. No matter how heel you are, there are some boundaries you just don't cross. And even if you're the biggest villain in the world, you don't mess with mama. Just sets it all up. But this WWF championship match, granted at times during this era, it was so much about 
all about the McMahons, the McMahons, the McMahons, the McMahons. But that was the story at play here. You know, Vince is in Hunter's Corner. Stephanie, the women's champion at the time, is in Hunter's Corner. Shane McMahon is the referee. You've got the Stooges, Patterson and Briscoe, on standby from Vince. So you knew how this was going to play out. So the whole story of this made perfect sense, and it was played out very well throughout the course of the entire match. And you got some spectacular spots for you spot monkey lovers, including the one where Rock triple or not, excuse me, Rock Rock bottom both Triple H and Shane through the announce table. I mean, that was a cool ass spot, and they did some other cool ass shit in this show. But then when you get to the moment and Vince is interjected at the time, he's hit Rock with the title, and then he comes in and hits the chair. He waves off for a referee because Shane is still knocked out because Rock knocked him out earlier. Here come the Stooges, and they're beating down on Rock, and they're just building up the anticipation to the crescendo. And even at, before the match even began, the fans were chanting, Austin, 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 almost to the detriment of the fact that this you should be really cheering for The Rock because this is supposed to be his moment to deliver the come up. It's to Triple H. This is going to be his time to shine. But ultimately, I understood at the time because Austin wasn't really around that much because of the broken neck. It had been several months since a lot of people had seen him. So you were going to naturally gravitate to wanting to see the dude. And the whole story played out throughout the course of the entire show by J.R. and the King about where's Austin? Is he going to show up? Why hasn't he shown up? Is he going to show up? Has Vince, with all of his money and resources, paid off the rattlesnake? And just all of this. But then when you ultimately get to that moment and that music hits, my fucking God, you forget through the passage of time. You remember, but you also forget just how intensely those people love Stone Cold Steve Austin. You forget just how loud and massive and sustained those pops were. I mean, Hogan's had some massive pops over the years. Some other guys, returns, debuts, big moments, they've had massive pops. Like even Jericho had a massive pop when he pinned Triple H for the title before it got rescinded. Foley had a massive pop when he won the title on the January 4th, 99 edition of Raw. Massive pop. But there are few people ever in the history of anything that could compare with the pops during this time frame that Stone Cold Steve Austin got. And this pop at Backlash was tremendous. And my only knock about this, as Austin comes in, he clears house and Rock ends up pinning Triple H after hitting him with the rock bottom and the freaking people's elbow or excuse me, just the people's elbow. There's Linda and Earl Hebner. She sends Earl into count. It's one, two, three. Austin comes back out and they celebrate with beer afterwards, which is kind of a cool moment, was imagine if this would have happened at WrestleMania. Just think about that. How appropriate that would have been to not have it at a secondary show, even though Backlash used to have some cool stuff happen. WrestleMania was where this should have happened. WrestleMania is where The Rock should have had his moment. Because you think back over the years, The Rock, during his heyday, never won the title at WrestleMania. At 99, at WrestleMania 15, he was dropping to Austin. At 16, 2000, he didn't beat Triple H. At 17, he's walking in the champ, and Austin's leaving the champ. At 18, he's facing Hogan. I mean... What the fuck? <laughs> you just think about that. And you're like, Rock never got that crowning moment at WrestleMania. And this should have been at WrestleMania. This should have been the crowning moment for The Rock. And it never happened. I felt like it was a tremendous mistake looking back through the history of time. And I felt that way even at the time. I thought Rock not winning at WrestleMania 2000 was a huge mistake. And I thought just to come back and do this shit again at Backlash and make it Rock's moment, I thought it was the wrong timing. But it happened, and it was still an awesome moment for what it was. And again, if nothing else, it serves as a reminder that you don't have to do all this extreme shit all the time for shit to really work. It's a reminder of how much fun wrestling used to be, how much fun the WWF was at this time, how great the characters and performers and personalities were at the time, and how badly I wish we could have something close to this type of level of talent, storytelling, fan participation now. And we just don't. Backlash 2000, like I said, ultimately, is what WrestleMania 2000 should have been. 